All right, good morning. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, as uh, Laura said, this is the automation in, uh, in publishing panel. Uh, they gave me the hyperlocal graveyard panel this year, so they keep giving me ones that uh, are on shaky ground sometimes. But the, uh, but, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, you know, this is, <laughs> some people think that automation is antithetical to the very spirit and purpose of hyperlocal news, and other people think it's the only way to really make it profitable. Uh, I think it's, it's obviously an important issue that uh, gets under a lot of people's skins because what it really comes down to is who's going to be employed at a as a journalist and what those people spend their time doing. So, uh, at, Laura mentioned Jurnatic. That's obviously the elephant in the room until we bring it up. So, Jim's had direct experience with them, so I thought I'd throw it over to him first. Uh, Jim, what, what, I think we all know where Jurnatic went wrong. I don't think that's the right thing to parse on a panel like this, but what, what lessons did your organization take from that, and what are you doing with automation now? I think, I think the, uh, the issue with Jurnatic wasn't necessarily an issue with automation. It was uh, it was it was more sort of the uh, the basics uh, in terms of um, checks and balances within your system. So, um, you know, I, I I don't I don't think anybody argues that uh, there there needs to be some automation in the process of publishing and, and uh, journalism. It's it's how that process works that's uh, most cost effective and so the, the biggest thing that we learned from that uh, and, I, and I'm sure many other uh, publishers did as well is to make sure that the organiz even if you're working with an outside uh, vendor like uh, somebody like Jurnatic or building one yourself as we are trying to do now uh, is to make sure that uh, there is a layer of editing uh, somewhere within that process, either on the vendor side or on your uh, on your own side as a publisher, that, that adds to the cost, of course. Uh, but you need to make sure you are comfortable with that content. Um, I th I th the the idea of Jurnatic uh, is here to stay; it's not going to go away. Um, we have the luxury of having, um, you know, thirty two. Uh, publications in cities and suburbs around Chicago as well as uh, five other dailies. So we have the suburbs around Chicago covered very well. And we have the luxury of being able to test systems, and, and which we are. So we're testing um, some automation with both our uh, current uh, pu publications and titles as well as uh, testing different kinds of automation with in, in towns where we currently aren't in. And what we're doing there is specifically testing what kinds of layers of editing and controls you need in order to be successful. So we're looking at both the cost of that, how do you do that efficiently. It's all, you're, you're still dealing with humans and humans make errors every day and you just need to make sure that you're, you're being careful. And what about buy-in as far as your newsroom goes to uh, jumping into these kind of ideas? It's, uh, as you can imagine, in a uh, very traditional news town newspaper, it is uh, extremely difficult for uh, many traditional journalists to get their arms around it. But um, as I've told the staff, it's either move forward or die. And that's what we are, everybody in our industry is faced with right now. I don't sugarcoat anything. And uh, I thought I'd jump to Brian next. Uh, Brian, uh, Brian's with Every Block, and uh, you started out with uh, almost exclusively automated content. Is that right? Yeah, when Every Block launched, we were really about data at our core and the, the automation of aggregating that data and serving it up to a user within the neighborhoods or even the block that most interested them. And for us, I think um, that type of content, different in a lot of respects from what Jim was talking about with the Sun-Times, for us it was things like crime reports, building permits, liquor licenses, restaurant inspection activity in, in a given neighborhood. And um, what we noticed is that 
while that had appeal, that appeal was somewhat niche and limited. And uh, as far as developing every block as a sustainable business, it wasn't really the answer for us. Um, we saw traffic essentially plateau over time. And in thinking broadly about our goals at every block, we want to be seen as part of someone's daily digital news routine. And with that automated aggregation play alone, that wasn't really gonna get us there. So we relaunched the site in March of 2011 that added a social layer on top of that previous just simple aggregation layer. And that's what's really accelerated our most recent growth. So for us, yeah, we, we started in automation. Uh, it's an important ingredient of what we do, but we knew that it couldn't be our kind of, uh, we couldn't be a one trick pony in that regard. And you, you felt that what was missing specifically was the human element that social provides. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good, good way of putting it. Um, for a lot of people, again, I think this kind of speaks to the niche appeal. It can be uh, somewhat dry and also creepy to a certain extent if you're just looking at, say, crime reports, reported crimes in your surrounding neighborhood or things like building permits. It has a very robotic feel in terms of the user experience, the experience design, and how you can serve that up. It can be very valuable information, but it's, um, it's just very bland. Um, it can be seen almost as data for the sake of data. But adding that human element, the ability to have conversations about that data or bring up conversations uh, separate from the subject of that data, that's really um, what we felt started to evolve every block into an increasingly interesting uh, business proposition. Right, and kind of a, and just one more question, then I'll jump to Gary, but uh, kind of a similar question to what I asked uh, Jim. Did you, uh, he has to get a newsroom to buy into automation. You have to get users to buy into kind of interacting with these automated components. Was that, was that a challenge at all? <laughs> no, the, the, getting the users to buy into the automated piece, I'd say, was, is, has been easier than getting users to buy in and um, best take advantage of the, the community piece, um, because that's where community moderation becomes an issue and, you know, kind of, I don't want to go off on that tangent because I know this is more about automation, but I think the automation piece is, was very easy for users to get used to and understand, but again, it just, um, we found it to have limited appeal in the way that we were including it in the every block experience. Right, and so, uh, Gary, what's uh, going on at Datasphere as far as uh, these automation issues go? And uh, specifically, uh, particularly interested to hear from you about uh, the business and sales side of things. Sure, so let me talk just really quickly about our thought on the content front, and then I'll go into some of what we've learned on the business and, and monetization side, which is certainly a specialty of ours. On the content front, I think that you, you've got to sort of take one step back and say two components to the question. What is content? And the second is what is automation, right? It sounds like an easy question, but the reality is, to me, content is more like you know, a dietary plan where you've got different components. You know, you've got carbohydrates, proteins, fats, etc. And so with content, same kind of thing. You have a set of content which is more amenable, I would say, to automation. I'll give you some examples of that. Obviously, uh, crime reports and so forth are one. But you've got things like, you know, real estate listings or, um, you know, how, how's the market going? And I think a lot of people are interested in what's their home worth. And for most people, it's their biggest single asset. And they, every month, they're interested to see whether the neighborhood prices went up or down and who sold what and what happened to the house in the corner and so forth. Uh, event type content, which is an area that we've sort of invested in. We work with companies like Eventful and Westworld Media, sort of fairly data focused. Um, uh, uh, deals, coupons, things like that, which are also pretty amenable to, to um, uh, data-heavy uh, type content that can then be used in a, in a more automated fashion. And there's companies out there, I'm sure you guys are well aware of companies like Narrative Science and so forth, who have invested in almost sophisticated templates that can take that data-heavy type content and turn it into something that's more easily ingestible uh, by the average person. And I think they're doing some really interesting stuff. 
However, obviously you have the more sort of standard news, human interest stories and so forth that make up. I mean, you just got to watch TV, uh, television news to see how much the human interest component is, is a, a, a foundation of this kind of uh, reporting. And so that is obviously not going to be something that's, that's um, automated in the same fashion that a data-heavy type content is going to be. But even there, what, you know, what is the defini definition of automation? You know, on the one hand, you can say, I press a button on a computer and out spits a story. OK, that's one extreme. But at the same time, you've got the opportunity to sort of like extend and enhance what you can do with the level of investment on the human e end. So for example, you know, the an analogy would be a telescope. The telescope doesn't do the seeing, but it allows the person who's looking to see further. And the same kind of thing here. If you can pull things together, you can make a human reporter far more effective, being able to cover more things and more effectively by giving them tools. Is that automation? Well, yes, in a sense it is, but it's not just about the automation. It's about investing appropriately so you can get more out of your human investment, which over the long term is likely to be your most expensive investment. So if you can take one journalist and allow them to do three times as much and do it better, that's a good thing. And so there are, are, are many opportunities for doing that kind of thing as well. So uh, also crowdsourcing, of course, you know, we talked about the social aspect and so forth. That, that route obviously has a lot of potential, but has some dangers as well. I mean, I'd, I'd indicate topics, I guess, as an example of that. Well, they're driving a lot of page views, but you know, the, the type of content you end up with is very much, I think, driven by how much moderation uh, you're prepared to do there and so forth, because we've all seen the scenarios where it becomes a, a basically Republican versus Democratic you know, spam fest. You know, is that compelling content? Well, I don't know. I mean, for some people, clearly it is, because it drives a lot of page views. But I think it's hardly in the same league that I think we would like to see uh, the direction of, of journalism in general. So anyway, that's our thought uh, at a high level in terms of the content side of things. On the business side, I'd sort of break it into three chunks. First off is you've got the sales front. So what can you do to make a sales force, which much like you know, on the content side, the, the, the cost of the human element is where most of your dollars are going to go. So if you can make a salesperson twice as effective, that is a complete, you know, that, will, that will define whether you're successful or not in most cases. Then you've got the fulfillment side of things. So once somebody actually buys something, how do you actually deliver to them? And then the third component is the customer support or sort of proactive communication. So we look at each of those and try to figure out how to make them work effectively. On the sales side, we looked at a lot of different tools. We looked at Salesforce, we looked at ACT, we looked at Goldmine and so forth. And at least from our perspective, there wasn't something that fit our needs in terms of um, high velocity. All of our sales, by the way, just in terms of background, we have about 250 sales reps, all inside sales reps, all on the phone, calling from Seattle and Phoenix. And we work with a number of media partners from Gannett to Meredith to Raycom, local TV, et cetera. And we call all around the country, from Washington, D.C., to Dallas, to Denver, to Seattle, and Phoenix, and so forth. But we need a way where those inside sales reps who are selling products that are usually in the you know, $100 to $300 per month range, where they can actually reach out to a lot of people and figure out which ones are going to be you know, more likely to convert. And I, you know, in all honesty, I would say we're still at you know, step one or two of a, a 10 plus step journey. There's a long way to go, but we have learned a few things about where to source prospect lists from. Uh, we use external sources as well as uh, you know, an internal uh, list that we have purchased from, from uh, various providers. But we have a system now that we've built that allows us to get feedback. It's sort of like a continuous learning, and I think that's, that's important. Um, to, to make that successful. Also, you've got to figure out which products are profitable. Not only products are of the same profitability, even if they're generating the same gross revenue per month, some of them have higher margins than others. Well, how do you set up a commission system that does that? Um, obviously, we don't have time to go into all of that here, uh, but that's a... That's Gary, a uh, would you say at, 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 bo at the bottom of all of this, your, your company's sales philosophy is still at bottom a human getting on the phone and selling an ad to another human, or 
or is it more complicated than that now? Is it evolving out of that? Uh, I, I would say it's evolving. I think we see that there's sort of a, a three-pronged strategy that we're going to, actually a four-pronged strategy that we're going to sort of over time. Certainly the core of what we're doing is, is very much that, a human selling to a human. Uh, there's clearly though potential there to invest as your product becomes simpler and, um, and, and, and easier to communicate uh, there is more potential for self-serve type options and you know Google AdWords is an example of that although even that you know managing a keyword list can become quite complex uh, we see an opportunity for some of the things that we have built and, and learned about by using the human sales force to sort of productize those turn them into a more standalone product that can then effectively be sold through self-service there's also the opportunity there once you establish a relationship to sort of manage, sort of account manage and upsell people over time, uh, especially as your products evolve and so forth. And then, you know, finally, there's the opportunity to actually have those productized products made available to external third parties so you can sort of leverage, it's, you're not constrained by your own sales team, but you can leverage other sales teams as well. Right. And I, I wanted to jump back to Jim. Uh, your newspapers uh, recently uh, partnered with uh, Homicide Watcher. I, you can use the more precise term, uh, yeah. but uh, you know it's uh, been uh, kind of a, a darling of this automation and kind of the hero where Jernatic was the villain. And I was wondering if you could talk about some about that partnership and what you see in it. Yeah, so uh, I'm glad you brought that up. I was just going to uh, talk about that. The what we saw with Homicide Watch in Washington, um, you know, newspapers do a great job. Um, uh, as, the, as, as does um, every block and some other uh, uh, forms of uh, content delivery uh, systems of, of tracking cr crime and, da and, and murder data and homicide. But there, there is the value proposition that we have and always will bring to our readers is putting things into context. What we saw with Homicide Watch in Washington where they were tracking every murder all the way through the process, both focusing on the victim as well as the perpetrator, knowing that you know there is a human element behind every murder uh, that often is missed, uh, just because it's more of a stats-driven kind of um, uh, system world that we live in, um, is that they uh, found a very strong community that uh, engaged with that content in a very uh, different way than uh, we have ever seen before, and given the you know the the murder rate exploding in Chicago, we spent the year obviously f uh, focused on a series of stories looking at you know the causes, police department, uh, everything that you would expect a newspaper to do. But what we were missing is sort of finding you know you know th th these people's these people who were killed have lives, and 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 that's what people want to read about. So the question is, how do you do that in a low-cost way? Folks at homicidewatch.org, I have no idea how their technical platform, how it actually works. Uh, we supply the, the boots on, on the street, but we can do that in a very, uh, we think, low-cost way using uh, interns and, and young reporters and giving them the tools and training that they need to follow these cases all the way through. Uh, I have no idea. I don't expect this to be a big money maker for us. For us, it's about engaging with the community um, and, 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 and taking it to a different level where people can actually have conversations about these cases. And what we found with Homicide Watch in Washington is that the people just will stay with a case all the way through. They just become really engaged with it. Um, so that's what we're looking for. It's a big experiment for us, but one we have to do, I think. Right, yeah, what I find so fascinating about Homicide Watch, and probably a lot of people in this room have heard of it, and if you haven't, you should check it out, is that, uh, you know, there's, I think there's a natural tendency to think that, you know, the machines are out to get us in terms of automation, that it's just going to make content less human, as, as uh, Brian and every block discovered quickly, but this is an example of something that, where we already had police blotters where 
uh, these things like a, a homicide were already missing that human element, uh, and that's been going on for decades and decades, and now uh, with this tool, we're, they're able to become, in fact, more human and have a face put on them. Our, let me just, our, our big issue is that uh, Washington had less than 200 murders. We had more than 500, so the big challenge for us is can we do this really cost-effectively and, and meaningful for the reader? Right, absolutely. And um, maybe uh, either Brian or Gary could speak to this somewhat, is uh, from f kind of where content and business meet, getting, um, getting advertisers to you know, pony up to put ads alongside things that are automated or have an element of automation, is, is that a challenge? Is, could one of you speak to that? I can speak to it quickly uh, if you want to add to it. Um, we're really in the early stages of, of even uh, adding advertising to the every block experience. We, we recently launched our own uh, self-serve native product called a couple weeks ago. And uh, so while we're, you know, I'm anxious to gather learning on that topic, I think one of the potential pitfalls for us is, um, you know, content on every block, it can kind of fall into that category of, uh, you know, watching, watching the car crash. It's, um, it's, it's riveting, but it can also be controversial. It can also be um, a bit testy or chippy at times. And uh, advertisers clearly want to be associated with positive content for the most part. I think the best example of that is I saw someone from Pandora give a keynote not long ago, and what a great advertising experience when an advertiser can place their advertising next to the music that you've chosen that makes you feel good. You know, that's, that's a great match. Um, we, don't, we don't have that luxury on every block, and so it's something that we're gonna have to address. Um, you know, it's interesting when you think about, ooh, someone's reporting on crime, and wouldn't it be great to have an ADT or a State Farm ad next to that? Perfect, but that's not the case for all advertisers, and so we don't have the answer for that, but you know, it's a fun challenge that I, I think we look forward to, to tackling. Uh, from our perspective, I think you know, the key is what type of content you're talking about. You can't sort of make a blanket statement. We've been fortunate that we have a lot of partners who are obviously heavily dedicated to quality journalism and they've invested heavily. I think you know, some of the guys like uh, Ray Coleman Gannett have really put some excellent journalists on the case. So for those, those communities that are staffed by those people, it's never been an issue. I think uh, people like to feel like they're contributing to the community and, and, and providing a, um, a venue where information about that neighborhood can bubble up is definitely a community service. I mean, in some cases, the neighborhoods, certain neighborhoods are clearly not profitable, and yet, yet our partners uh, will continue to invest in them as part of you know, an overall community service, part of their overall brand, et cetera. So those sorts of products have never been an issue. And then the other ones that we try to focus on are ones where the content has a natural affinity to what the advertiser is trying to say. And so I think you, know, you see a number of folks on the mobile side where that's been recognized because the screen is so small, it's hard to kind of have content then add because you, you, it's always sort of like a conflict. You can do some interstitials and so forth. But the more you can make the ad and the content the same, uh, the better you're going to be. And that's why you know, our focus on events and in particular coupons now, um, we think there's a lot of opportunity there because the two merge together. People are interested in what's going on. What's going on is obviously you know, usually in a venue or has something to do with businesses. And the same with uh, getting a good deal. People are interested in that. So to them, that's content, much like classifieds were for newspapers. But for the advertisers, it's also the advertisement. So, depending on the type of content, you know, the answer may vary. Right, and and what? So, in terms of your your sales force and what? Uh, I think you talked a little bit about this, but I'm I'm curious of, you know, for um, for the journalist, what what automation. Ex extends their reach by uh, bringing more information in front of their you know, eyes more quickly. Well, is it a similar experience for your sales force? Like what, what specifically is, is going on there that kind of is a value add for them? 
Um, I think there's a couple of things. One is obviously who do I call, you know, if you walk, walk through the, the process from start to finish, um, you know, at each stage of the way there's a level of automation that can help you be more efficient. And like, it's, it's like any business process, frankly. It's, you, you start with, with your best guess initially and then you try different things over time and certain things work better than others. And one of the advantages we have in this day and age is collecting information, trying different things is easier than ever if you've set up a platform that lets you do it, and then you evolve, because none of us know the answer up front. I mean, you can be the smartest guy in the world. Bezos, who I would sort of hold out there, I guess, is one of the, you know, the, the luminaries of these days. He'll be the first to admit, in fact, if you, if you listen to his speeches, he goes down a lot of dead ends. But at the end of the day, by doing that, you learn what doesn't work, and you also learn what does work. And I think that's... That's the key, you know, I you don't have time to go into all of the details here, I'm happy sure. to after, yeah. after the panel, but um, that to me is the key, is try to set up something where you can try different things and you have a feedback loop so you can improve them over time. Right, and um, this is one, cl one last, o only slightly perverse question, I think. Is, we all know the uh, uh, kind of the controversial components of automation on the editorial side. Are, is there a similar controversy on the business side, is there a, is there a dark side to all this for sales? Uh, I, I think well, the I, I would call it the human element, and and I don't I wouldn't call it a dark side, but I would call it the challenge of um, getting everybody's interests aligned is probably the best way to try it. Because one of the things that was a learning for me, my background um, prior to to working at DataSphere was much more on the technology side, and. You, you have the luxury, and you know, like people like working with robots because they, you know, they don't get sick. I mean, they may break down, but they don't get sick. They don't, you know, the whole lot of a whole lot of the human element is taken out, and you know that that can be a good or a bad thing. But as you deal with a team of 250 people who every day are looking at how does this affect what my take-home pay is, it is amazing how conservative that organization will be. Everything that you do. Um, needs to be sort of done in light of how is you know how is that going to affect them because you know and rightly so that they have a very specific objective, but not only are they focused on you know what does my commission check look like over that period, but also there's a there's a level of um, how can I put it uh, variability psychology and so forth you, you can't even necessarily predict with a purely logical approach to what's going on. And so with a lot of these things, there's as much investment in almost internal marketing, if I can put it that way, as there is in what the actual project is itself. A classic example recently is we, we changed our commission system to more accurately reflect um, the profitability to the company in terms of what we were selling. And we had to go through a lot of iterations as to how we could adjust you know, the commission and, and not just adjust it so that it was technically optimal, but also had a level of transparency and compellingness to the sales team such that they would buy into it as well. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have the sort of the hearts and minds on your side, it's very difficult to make anything else work. So um, being aware of that and investing in the internal communication, I think, is, is, is critical. Um, over time, uh, I, I always like to hear uh, Court uh, Cunningham speak. I don't know if you guys know him. He's the CEO of Yodel. But um, he has some, some interesting anecdotes in terms of what they've done with their platform as well. And at the end of the day, they've gotten to a point where they're actually, the sales team can't make outbound calls. They, they have to trigger a call from a list of things that, that, that are presented to them. And obviously that provides you with a lot more sort of uh, tight control over the sales team. We're certainly not at that point at this stage, but you know, it's an interesting view on how people approach managing a sales force, which has a lot of these um, less, less tightly controlled elements because you're dealing with people. Well, just to jump in on this one, I think, and not to overly state what might be obvious, but I think if you talk about the dark side of automation in general, um, whether that be with sales or, or content, I mean, there's mounting evidence that this is just a, a net, you know, job destroying proposition. So we all sit up here and we're talking about making our businesses profitable and sure that's the goal as leaders of a company, but overall, you know, you know if, we're, if we're trying to 
advance as a, as a category or an industry, we need to focus on growing our companies by way of creating additional jobs. And I think the concern is that automation can deliver a lot on the efficiency side, but it's really destroying um, a lot of jobs. So not to get all political about it, but I think that's a very, a very real aspect that a lot of us are facing. And um, finding the, the fine balance between delivering the bottom line that's required, but also um, creating stability on the job side is, is a tough thing right now. I, I have a slightly different perspective to that. I think, to me, it's almost the opposite in the sense that, and I'm sure you intended this as well, but it's almost like if you can't hit a certain level of efficiency, then there is no business. And, and so for us, if we can make our sales reps 1.5x more effective, guess what? We're not going to have two-thirds the number of sales reps. We'll have 10 times the number of sales reps. We'll have 20. We'll keep going because the more we can we can demonstrate profitability and so forth, the larger we can grow the enterprise. So to me, the, the efficiency side of it is more fuel for growth rather than an excuse for um, for um, you know taking away uh, taking away the investment. If that's the right way to put it. Right. Absolutely. And I'm sure. And I think that's a lot of uh, what Brian raised is a lot of the issue on the editorial side is. At the end of the day, the people making hiring decisions have to be trusted to spend that money on that money that's freed up by automation on people rather than on. Yeah, if I could, if I could add to pockets, Brian's yeah. point, uh, which is a very good point, um, it, it, we obviously, like everybody else in our industry, have been faced with uh, challenging um, uh, financial situation in, where, in which we've had to make some very tough decisions, and so we look at the automation part of it. It really is okay. Can I? If, I if this job has to go because of automation, can I really uh, put a reporter on the street that's going to be more effective for us? Um, and, and that's really digging deeper. I mean, we've, we've asked reporters for so long to do a lot of the things that the automation process can do for us now. Where we're going to survive is, is, again, the context that we can provide for readers. And, and it's going to mean paring down what we cover. It's not going to be everything. It's not going to be things that every block can now cover that we don't need to cover necessarily, but really focusing on, on those things that we can deliver that nobody else can in the city. Right. Well, I think we have a little more than five minutes left up in, under the lights here, so I wanted to open it up to audience questions, or anyone else here can feel free to jump in if there aren't any, but are there any questions? Can you talk a little bit about both on the sales side and the editorial side? You know, we talk about uh, automation kind of provides that nice base layer, and so we talk about human then being able to add on to that. What kind of training are you providing, or do you see other people providing, or is needed in the marketplace so that journalists who are used to going out and digging through the, the paper to find the data and put it together can now actually spend more of their time layering it on top? And same thing with the sales side, where they're normally out there hitting the streets, uh, knocking on doors. Now they're sitting in a call center, potentially, uh, you know, across the country or even across the globe. What kind of training is in place or should be in place to do that? I can take it from a content side. I mean, that's a very good question, and one we're going to grapple with with uh, when we start working with Homicide Watch. Um, and newspapers notoriously have been uh, very poor trainers. It's more like you know, you you uh, it's sink or swim, and you go out and you figure out how to work the court system, how to get that data in. We're now asking, we are going to ask reporters to do more high-level reporting almost out of the box. So that we do have to, it's one of the things we've talked about is how do we institute this layer of training and professionalisms to make sure that we're not going to have somebody who gets thrown out there in a bigger story and can't, can't understand the data that he or she is working off of. I mean, it's a very important element for us. And it's, again, it's going to cost us some money, but it's necessary. I think uh, just quickly from the sales side, uh, we, we bring our guys on board. Um, interestingly, they come from all sorts of different backgrounds. There's not one specific profile, um, but certainly a competitive instinct team sports seems to be an interesting sort of um, one aspect that, that does indicate a higher probability for success. And then uh, they go through a series of different uh, training uh, opportunities. They have one week of just full-on training, learning about the product learning about, in particular, because we have such relationships with um, strong brands, one of the key focuses for us is 
to make sure that whatever we're doing uh, is in line with sort of the brand ethics and so forth. So we, we um, educate them on that front. And then after they've sort of learnt all the basics, the tools and so forth that, that largely we have built for them, um, then we pair them up with a more senior rep and they work with them and they sort of gradually are migrated into uh, the full-on uh, system. And then, you know, from that point, we have usually about a, a three-month uh, period during which they, you know, they either demonstrate they have what, they t what it takes or, or they don't, and then, you know, uh, they either stay with us or they don't. So it's sort of a, you know, like most training programs, I guess, a sort of an evolution of uh, a heavy investment, classroom time, uh, hands-on computers and so forth through the practical side of things, and then, you know, they... The, the sales manager gradually lets them do more and more on their own. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, please. There's a microphone coming your way. Yes, we, uh, we're Town Wizard and we run a, a 150 local mobile guides and um, we have not been able to understand the uh, ability to do national advertising because when people are doing the local advertising they are, and they're in the market, they're so much more effective. Um, so could you speak a little bit to having a group of people in Seattle selling into New Orleans? Yeah, um, in a lot of cases, I think it does depend on the product in particular and certainly you know you can look around the industry and see examples I you know reach local I think is a is a good example of they've invested very heavily in feet on the street and for the types of products they're selling at the price points that they're selling and so forth um, that has obviously worked pretty well for them um, from our perspective though uh, our guys obviously we, we actually have people from all around the country within the sales team but clearly they're selling usually into probably about 10 different markets, so they can't know all of them, that level of detail. But the thing that the businesses are interested at, in at the end of the day is, is this thing going to deliver results to me? And so to the extent that um, there's a, a level of trust and credibility that, that we're able to generate by working with local brands that they're very familiar with, and then layer on top of that delivery of real value, um, we're, we're answering, we may not have the warm and fuzzies of somebody walking into a business, but we're answering uh, the question that the business is asking. And would it be different if we were trying to sell them a $2,000 a month product? Yes, probably. But at the price points we're talking about, I think that the businesses are willing to take more of a risk than they would be in that particular circumstance. So sales is a very sort of complex thing with many different variables, but I think we have an interesting formula. Uh, it will evolve, but it's working for us and it's working for our partners at this point. Well, uh, that's all the time we have, unfortunately, but I hope if anyone else has any other questions, they'll just approach uh, any one of us after, after this wraps up here. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.